super excited to uh, to have Ben here today with us. Hey, Ben, thanks for coming virtually. So Ben is a research scientist in Google Brain uh, for the last four years, right after grad school. Uh, he graduated from Stanford, interestingly, working in a neural dynamics and computational lab, uh, uh, like, like, I guess, non-computer graphics or vision or VR, AI related, right, Ben? I'm sure you're going to talk about that. And then with some amazing ideas and creative work um, is basically leading now the field of uh, 3D generation from text and um, synthetic imagery and so on. So um, which if you think about AR, VR uh, in the future, how we, in my opinion, how we might create content would be by just like, you know, a combination of some version of chat GPT plus 3D automatic modeling generation and so on. So, and Ben is gonna talk about some of those things. So super exciting. Welcome Ben and uh, glad to have you here. Awesome. Thank yeah. you very much uh, Ira for that generous intro and David for uh, helping to organize this whole thing. Uh, really excited to talk to you guys today. And um, as Ira was saying, I don't know very much about AR or VR or graphics or vision. Um, I come from a background more in neuroscience and in machine learning and deep learning. And I think we found a great way of combining some of the expertise that I have here at Google with a bunch of amazing uh, 3D vision researchers, um, but feel free to interrupt with any questions along the way. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about 2D priors for 3D generation. Um, and this is work with an amazing team of Ben Mildenhall, who just moved to San Francisco, and Ajay Jain and John Barron um, here at Google Research. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you might have some sense of how you can go about creating 3D models like the ones on the right um, strictly from text prompts. And I think for uh, for everyone, it's been a pretty crazy year um, and pretty crazy 10 years even in 2D generation. When I started working um, at the start of grad school on generative image models, uh, you would produce results like this in the lower left. This is, a, I think, from a GAN trained on CIFAR-10. And these were good looking images. They had a lot of different colors and textures and qualities that you might want that reflected some of what was there in the data sets. Um, and now today you can kind of create anything that you want. Um, it's been many years and many different methodologies, but I think the current methods centered around diffusion models have really led to a lot of this progress. Uh, and even in just the past year, it's been hard for me to keep up with the amount of uh, work in this space on gener generative images and video. Uh, at Google, we've worked on things like Imagine, Imagine Video, Party, um, and Finaki for text to video. Um, Meta's done some amazing work on Make a Video and OpenAI with Dolly 2, Stability with Stable Diffusion and MidJourney. All these tools are really enabling artists to create anything that they can dream up. Um, so if you're just sitting there and you think, hey, you know, I'd love to create an image of an elephant wearing a birthday hat, um, we can create this. And oftentimes the fidelity is pretty good. It maybe isn't as good as a photograph or a model that you might create, um, but you can iterate and play around with these tools. They're often pretty fast um, and effective. Uh, and we can even do things like turn this elephant into a whole video. This is a result from Imagine Video of a happy elephant wearing a birthday hat walking under the sea. And these videos are often really cool and compelling and interesting and dynamic, but something's not quite right about them. So it might be a little hard over Zoom, but if you look at the legs of this elephant, you can see how they kind of blur together and overlap. And there's something a little weird if you look at any of the generative video models right now where they don't seem to capture this understanding of the 3D world, that there's objects that are moving and cameras that are moving too. Um, and I think that a critical component for making these image and video models work better is to understand more about uh, the 3D world, but we need to figure out how to get there. And so, uh, yeah, this a lot of the research we've been doing recently at Google has been centered around how we can build 3D generative models, not just 2D um, or video models. And while I'm new to uh, generative 3D research, I've been trying to generate things in 3D for a while. This is me trying to create some stuff out of clay um, as a kid. And um, I you know, did not succeed much past this. I think it was supposed to be a dinosaur. And in general, having played around with some 3D modeling tools, it's extremely difficult for uh, to get up to speed and to start creating 3D objects. And it'd be great if we could transform some of the ease of use of some of the image and video tools that have been built to the 3D world. So what? how are we going to get there? I think. In deep learning these days, there's a pretty simple playbook for how to solve a task. Um, we first are going to collect a really big data set. Uh, for example, scraping the internet for lots of uh, images or videos. And then we're going to create a really big model. And we're going to train it for a long time on all this data. And then out is going to come a great model that's able to reflect some of the properties of this data set for better or for worse and generate new content that maybe didn't exist in the data set. 
Um, and when we try to think about applying the same playbook of collecting big data sets and training big models in the 3D world, we hit uh, two different issues. One is that 3D assets are currently very hard to produce and very expensive. Here's a, a cat asset from TurboSquid that's $1,100. So if every single data point that you're going to use for your model and you need millions of them, it's $1,000. It's a pretty expensive endeavor. Um, and I think the other issue is we don't really know how to represent three-dimensional data. There's a number of different ways you could go about it. You could think about representing 3D space as a bunch of voxels or meshes or point clouds or octrees or other descriptors. So like even there isn't like this canonical way of representing three-dimensional data sets. Um, whereas for images and for video, we often have the pixel data and that's a standard format that we have uh, good methods to work with. And now each of these different ways of thinking about representing that 3D data is also gonna require different neural network architectures that we're gonna have to learn. Um, and so people have developed things like 3D units on top of voxel data, but for things like meshes and point clouds, they have a lot of discrete structure and invariances that you might wanna model within these, uh, these deep architectures. And it's not really clear what architectures we can build. And there's been some success in, uh, in the space of trying to take data sets of 3D models and then fit uh, what I might call direct 3D generative models. We try to build the generative model directly on top of 3D data. Here on the left, there are some examples from Get3D, which is a mesh-based generative model. And these are really high quality, but often uh, only trained on a restricted set of categories. So it's hard to generalize and create new objects that haven't been seen within the training data set. And recently, there's also been some cool work on point clouds um, from OpenAI Pointy, which trained on a large data set of 3D models represented as points. And this allows you to generate new shapes, but the quality often isn't that high, even though there's pretty good global coherence in the shapes. And one of the big limiting factors for creating these 3D generative models is that we just haven't had large scale data sets of 3D objects. Um, a lot of the academic research uses ShapeNet, which is a relatively small data set with a few categories. There's recently this really cool data set called Objiverse from the Allen Institute that I'm excited to start playing with. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of have this really big gap between what we can do with existing 3D generative models when they're trained on 3D data sets because these 3D data sets are really limited. And just in, in pictorial form, um, there's a set of real world objects that we might want to generate, or even not just for real world objects, we might want to create and think about um, all sorts of new different 3D models, objects, game characters that haven't existed before. And we want to describe them and create them even if nothing like it has appeared in our current world. Um, and then there's the set of 3D models that we have access to, um, and that's growing as people are collecting new data sets and people are uh, building and designing new 3D models, but it's quite small relative to the set of all the things we'd like to create. And in contrast, I think in the pixel space with images and video, we have much bigger data sets, orders of magnitude bigger than in 3D models. So if we're thinking about trying to build some kind of generative model for 3D that knows a lot about the visual world, it can't just be trained on 3D models. That's too restricted of a set of data for us to train on. We really need to start uh, finding ways of incorporating these other domains and modalities and leveraging what they've learned about the visual world in order to inform um, generative 3D. And in particular, we have kind of two approaches that have been built around uh, one, one set of methods for image text data sets uh, based off of contrastive learning or clip models, and then another based off of diffusion models. Okay, so now we have some aspirations. We wanna use images and maybe video data to create 3D models, but we don't know how to piece these things together. And to do that, we're gonna to need to think about how to represent the 3D world. What's this representation? Are we doing meshes or point clouds or something else? And then we also need to think about once we have this 3D representation that we wanna learn, how are we gonna adjust it and adapt it to some requirement, like some text description of what we wanna create in that 3D model. Any questions on kind of the this, this setup or the some of these problems around data sets for 3D generation so far? Cool, I'm happy to, happy to go on then. Um, yeah, so for 3D representations, we decided to um, build on top of NERF or neural radiance fields. These are a really cool set of methods that have been designed to reconstruct 3D models from real world images. Um, so right now you can take your cell phone and you can walk around very slowly around some object that you want to capture in 3D, and then you can run this optimization procedure and get out a 3D model. And the way that these uh, neural radiance field, their NERF models work, um, is that we're going to represent the 3D world as a volume. And uh, when we're trying to render what this volume might look like, we cast a ray into the scene. So for every pixel in some image that we want to create, we cast a ray into the scene. Um, and then we evaluate a set of points along that ray in the 3D volume. 
And the main thing that we're going to learn as part of this procedure is a neural network that takes us input a 3D coordinate where you are within the volume, and then it outputs a color and a, a density or opacity at that point. And given kind of the values for all of the densities and opacities along the ray, we can combine their colors and opacities to get a final rendered pixel. This is just classical volume rendering. Um, and so over the course of optimization, we're going to be updating this neural network. Uh, and the downside with NERF is that it requires a large set of observed images. This is, some, this is a method that can be used to capture existing objects. And when we train a NERF model, we're going to evaluate uh, how well this volume that we're learning, parameterized by a neural network, matches to some ground truth views. So we have some prediction that we observe from some camera, and we have the NERF rendering from that camera, and we're going to compute a loss which says how close does our prediction match this ground truth. When we're trying to generate things, we don't have any ground truth. Uh, we might have something like a text description. So what we really want to do is find a loss function where we can replace this mean squared error loss, matching this NERF model to some observations with an image text loss, for example, which says, how well does this uh, rendered view of a bulldozer match a text description, a Lego Technic bulldozer side view? Um, and so the real meat of the work that we've done here is trying to come up with these image text losses, which can say, how well does this rendering of the 3D model match some design requirement based off of a text description? And we don't just want to do this from one view or a handful of views. We want to do this from all views. And so we're going to start off with a random 3D model. Here's kind of the final output. But at initialization, you're going to have a random 3D model. We're going to render that from a random view to create a 2D image. And then we're going to score this 2D image using this pre-trained, uh, in this case, contrastive clip model. And that's going to give us a score for how well this rendered image matches the text caption of frog wearing a sweater. And the difference between the two uh, research projects we've done, in the first one, Dream Fields, the way that we evaluate how similar the rendered image is to the text caption is using clip, um, a contrastive model. And in uh, Dream Fusion, our more recent work, we use a loss derived from the imagined diffusion model. But fundamentally, it's the same idea that what makes a good looking 3D model and how we can use 2D priors for 3D modeling is just taking random renders of that 3D model and asking our 2D prior if that looks good. Um, and I think there'll be all sorts of new work by, by, you know, as we come up with more 2D models that can encompass other kinds of design requirements that are just text, maybe they're images, maybe they're sketches. Um, you could think about coming up with losses that could compare the rendered image to some sketch and then trying to optimize the 3D model to match according to some other criterion. So I think this general family of approaches um, is really quite broad and it's allows us to bridge the gap between 3D and 2D. Okay, so a little bit more about uh, dream fields. Um, so here we start off with a 3D model on the right and then we take a random rendering and we don't just use the rendering itself. We often uh, augment it with a random background and this helps us to preserve. If we don't do this, for example, you can often get a lot of artifacts like white solid objects. So by having random backgrounds, we get better isolated 3D objects that you could place into other settings. And we take this uh, rendered image with a random background and we feed it through the clip image encoder. That gets us some embedding Z image. And then we can take the text description here. It's a boat on the water tied down to a stake. And we can evaluate how similar is this image encoder to the uh, text encoder. And here, this is just an inner product. The text encoder and the image encoder output vectors that are the same dimension. We can ask how similar they are. And we combine that with some other loss functions that try to make sure that this 3D model uh, you know, is relatively smooth and occupies not the entire space, but a small region in space. And we optimize over thousands and thousands of steps according to this loss until we have a good looking 3D model. And uh, our Dreamfields work, I would say, works OK. Um, here on the left are some examples of a teapot in different shapes. So there's a teapot in the shape of brain coral, a teapot in the shape of a Rubik's cube. On the right, there's some armchairs. Uh, there's like a Pikachu armchair up here, a strawberry armchair down here. And you can see that there's some aspects of the text, um, like the brain coral, for example, that are reflected in the 3D model that we generate. But the overall structure of these isn't quite right. These teapots have many different spouts, and they're, you know, they have some shape of a teapot, but this isn't something that you would actually want to use in 3D print, for example. And on the right, none of these armchairs look very comfy to sit on. So they're capturing some texture aspects, but they often fail at the more global geometry. And so while we were working on this project, um, 
using Clip as a contrastive model to try to do 3D generation. There was a lot of amazing work that came out on text to image generation using diffusion models. And we saw these results and thought, you know, why can't we just swap out this clip thing for this diffusion thing and make everything look better? Um, the images that we got out of the text to image generative models were way more globally coherent. They looked quite realistic relative to the images that people were getting out of optimizing images according to these clip losses. Um, so we hope we could just swap these things out um, and everything would just work better. I see a hand if someone wanted to go ahead and ask a question. Yeah, so I guess, first of all, this is really, really cool. Um, but my question kind of is focused. It seems like this is very focused on the image generation aspect of it, which totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the image to text loss, I'm kind of curious about how do you handle, I guess, using multiple languages to kind of interpret an image as in like, you can't just use English, it has to be feasible for everybody, right? So like, I'm yeah. assuming there's a lot of like language processing that goes into that and like actually interpreting what does this word mean? because different languages use different words in different ways. So like, yes, how hard definitely. is that? I, definitely, I think that's a huge issue. And depending on the data set that you've collected, you're gonna have different meanings of that word in terms of how the image and text have related within your data set. I think there's been some cool work, uh, for example, OpenClip that has looked at training multilingual models that can take both English and kind of any language and embed it into a shared space with images. Um, and you can control it with different languages. I think it's a huge question, a huge problem about how you can make these models work robustly. For different languages and how we can build data sets that allow similar capabilities across different languages and also control. Maybe the model had the wrong interpretation of Jaguar. It thought it was a car and not the animal. And so right now we often have to see what the model outputs and iterate and like kind of learn ourselves what the model does understand and doesn't understand. But then from a user interface perspective, I think that makes it really challenging because you, you don't know what to expect with these models. Um, but I think they're improving and we're also trying to make them work better for other languages as well. Okay, cool. So yeah, so we wanted to try using what to us felt like a more powerful generative model of the world um, in Imagine or these text to image models. And I think the big question is what are we gonna use for this loss to compare rendered images and some text description? Um, and to understand that first, let's uh, get a little bit of a background on what the heck diffusion models are. Um, the key idea behind diffusion is that the way we're gonna create an image is very gradual. Um, so we're going to start off with a data set of images, and we can destroy structure in an image by adding more and more Gaussian noise. So here from the left to the right, we started with a clean picture of a dog, and we added more and more noise to it until on the right, there's no content left. It's entirely noise. Um, and what we learn when we're learning diffusion models is how to reverse this process, how to take something noisy and slowly add more and more structure back into the model. And what's nice is that a lot of the neural network models that we build are able to learn these relatively simple, well-defined tasks, like just remove a little bit of noise. But this process of mapping from a random noise vector to an image is much harder. And there's methods and techniques that we've been building to try to go directly from noise to images. But by making this problem simpler and breaking it up into a bunch of steps, it seems like these diffusion models are easier to train and easier to scale to bigger data sets. And I think that's been one of the main innovations that's driven a lot of the progress recently. And another way of thinking about this model, you can think about we have a data distribution or a distribution of kind of clean looking images. And as we add more and more noise to it, we're smoothing out this distribution. So here in the lower left, this is kind of visualization of uh, what you might expect from a relatively simple distribution. This is just the mixture of Gaussians with like a small variance. And then when we run this, what is called the forward diffusion process, where we're adding more and more noise to the clean images, um, this distribution gets smoother and smoother. And when it gets smoother, it's often easier for the neural network to model. Um, and the, the parameters that we're learning for these models are actually just simple denoising networks. Um, so for any amount of noise, we wanna take a noisy image and then feed it through the network and get a denoised estimate. Um, here, we'll often denote the denoised estimate as X at for a kind of a clean image. Or you can also think about these models as not predicting the denoised image, but asking what was the noise that you added. Um, and these are kind of the equivalent, you can relate, uh, relate them together. And so this is kind of uh, what we learn in these diffusion models are just these units. They depend on maybe some additional conditioning like a text prompt and uh, also the noise level. So they get to know how much noise was added in this process. Okay, so what kind of loss are we gonna use for diffusion models? And I think one of the questions we've gotten around this work is, well, like there's all these amazing papers and research results and products around image generation. Can you just like somehow use that for 3D? And I think the big issue is that the way that we sample or generate images from these diffusion models is this iterative process 
in pixel space. So we start off with a random noisy image, CT, and we're going to slowly introduce more and more structure into the, this image by denoising a small amount for many steps. So here we're, we're creating a frog wearing a sweater very slowly. And these updates happen in pixel space. But when we want to build 3D models, we don't want to operate in pixel space. We want to operate in some 3D representation. And there's a more general framework for thinking about this, uh, which is often called differentiable parameterizations of an image, where the idea is we have some parameters or the things that we're actually going to optimize that create the image. Um, and now we can't just update the image itself. We need to know how to update the parameters, the model, not the image. And to do that, we need a loss function. We need a way of measuring how good or bad the image is um, that we can then back propagate through to the image and then back through the mapping to the parameters. And so we need loss function to optimize for sampling, not just iterative sequence of updates in pixel space, which is how all the diffusion sampling algorithms work. So we tried a bunch of different things. This was like a, I would say, many month journey trying to find a loss function that worked. Um, we tried stuff that was based off MCMC, based off variational inference, uh, talked to all those I knew in deep learning who were really into uh, all different kinds of Bayesian neural networks and posterior inference. And none of these approaches really worked. And it turns out the, the resulting method and algorithm for incorporating it in model is pretty simple, but the path there was uh, pretty arduous. And I think uh, one, one way of getting there, I think, is a relatively straightforward idea, which is what if we just use the same training loss that we use to train the parameters of that unit or that denoising network? So I think the details on the right here aren't, aren't super important, but you can think about there's a, a loss function for the diffusion model that we train. It depends on the parameters of the unit model or of the denoising network, and it also depends on the data, the image that you input. And normally when we're training these models and learning a diffusion model on some data set, you, the, data, the data itself is fixed, you're giving it to me, and then I optimize for the parameters phi. And so we take this loss function and we're going to minimize it in terms of the parameters of the unit while the data set is fixed. We could do something different after training this model. We could think about freezing the parameters phi of the unit model, but then minimizing in terms of the data. So here I'm asking for what is a, da a data point for which this denoising model is really good at denoising. Like find me an image that when I add noise and denoise it is really close to that original image. Um, and there's some cool work uh, that came out a bit before a paper called Diffusion as a plug and play prior, um, which used this kind of loss to generate samples in, uh, in pixel space. Um, and we found that this didn't work uh, in the 3D context. I think that it might be dependent on the kind of diffusion model and some additional parameters around how you're choosing the noise levels in the diffusion process, but there's a simple modification of the diffusion training loss that did work. Um, and to understand this modification, we have to think about, well, what is the gradient of the diffusion loss with respect to the image? So think about what the actual update is. And you can write this in terms of three terms. The first term is uh, the noise residual. This is kind of saying, how well did you do at predicting the denoised image? And what is the direction from the denoised image to the noisy image. The second is uh, what we call here the unit Jacobian. This is saying, as I wiggle the input to the denoising network, how does the output change? And then the last bit is the generator Jacobian that says, how should I map updates in image space back to updates um, in the differentiable parameterization of the image? Um, and I think that, that this is uh, uh, maybe somewhat non intuitive, but if you remove this unit Jacobian term, for us, everything worked better. There's another way of arriving at this loss function through the perspective probability density distillation, which if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the paper. I'm happy to, um, to feel more questions on later. But in general, we're left with a relatively simple update direction for how we should change the parameters of our image model or of our 3D model so that it looks good according to the diffusion model. And this was a bunch of math. I'm happy to answer questions on this, or I can also walk you through. Uh, next, we'll see what are the algorithmic steps to implement this, which I think are often simpler than some of the mathematical steps. Um, but any questions before I move on? Yes, yeah, so you mentioned that you could remove the uh, unit Jacobian and get better results. Um, just for my recollection, uh, what does the Jacobian represent? And then what are you left with now? Yeah, so the um, we can think about the Jacobian here is the mapping. It's, it's saying how, as I perturb the input to the denoising network, how does the output change? So it's saying, how does the output change as a function of these perturbations in the input? 
so when right now, I guess it's written, this is a manipulation in terms of the gradient, um, but you can ask, well, what loss does that correspond to? Uh, you can think about the loss function that this is minimizing as trying to match some learned, you're trying to optimize for an image that is close to the density defined by the marginals of the diffusion process. So we had this clean, like this, this uh, sequence of marginal distributions which correspond to the data convolved with more and more noise. And you can think about the loss function that we're minimizing now as trying to match one image to this entire sequence of distributions. So that's the loss function that I would say corresponds to once you remove the unit. And that's actually how we arrived at the loss function in the paper. But implementation wise, and I think intuition wise, it's easier to think about it as a modification on the training loss. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on that? Okay, so um, let's think about how to actually use this in practice. And I think in practice, it's easier than worrying about all the math. Um, we're gonna have some mapping from the parameter to an image. Uh, there's some generator here, let's call it G of beta, that takes this input some parameters and outputs an image. This could, for example, be an identity function, in which case the theta that you're optimizing over here is just an image. Or eventually we'll see that we're gonna have a 3D model where theta are the parameters of the NERF. And this generator involves picking a random view and doing volumetric rendering. So we have some parameters, we create an image X. And then we're gonna sample random noise that's the same size as the image. And an amount of noise uh, corresponding to the time in the diffusion process T. And then we're gonna combine the image and the noise together to get a noisy image. We're gonna feed that noisy image into our diffusion model which, what is the diffusion model? It's a denoising network or unit that depends on some text caption here. So here the text caption is a DSLR photo of a peacock on a surfboard. And given this noisy image, it's asking, well, what's the most likely um, clean image that could have generated that noisy image? And now we can look at, well, what is the gap? Kind of what's the direction I need to move from the noisy image to the clean image? That's this epsilon hat, the residual between the denoise thing and the noisy thing. Um, and then we can remove a little bit more noise from this direction by subtracting off the initial noise that you added. And this thing here is the direction that you want to change your generated image so that it's more like the caption. And this is the supervision that the unit is, the unit and the diffusion model is giving you. It's telling you how to move around in pixel space to create an image that's more like that text. Um, and then we can backpropagate this uh, direction in pixel space back to a direction in parameter space by just looking at the Jacobian of um, the generator mapping, um, which you can just do with standard auto diff tools. Um, and here on the bottom, you can see this is the optimization trajectory. So these are eight different images where we randomly initialize the parameters theta. And then we say optimize the pixels so that it looks good. It looks like a peacock on a surfboard according to the imagined diffusion model. So you can see you start off with noise and it adds more and more structure. And this process is different than the normal ancestral sampling process that we use in a diffusion model, because here we're using an actual optimizer to update the pixels. We're feeding in a gradient update and then that's making a, uh, a step on the parameters themselves versus on pixels. Okay, so this was all in pixels, but what do we really care about? We wanna find ways of enabling 3D generation using a diffusion model. And returning to our earlier work on dream fields, we had some 3D model that we, rendered to an image from a random view. And then we compared it to some text using a contrastive loss derived from clip. Now we're just gonna swap out that contrastive loss from clip with the score distillation loss um, that depends on the imagined diffusion model. Um, so that's great. Um, you can do that. And if you look on the left here, this was our, some of our first set of results uh, for, I think this is like a painted turtle is the thing on the left and the video sequence is looking at the optimization trajectory for this turtle. Uh, and you can see it looks okay, but it's not very high resolution. Um, it's pretty blurry. It's not really clear what's going on. And on the right is the final set of results that we ended up releasing in the paper, which is I would say a pretty high quality 3D asset that definitely looks like, uh, I think this is like a golden tortoise with a top hat. So maybe the top hat positioning is off, but I think overall uh, it's much improved. So what happened between this initial idea and these final results? Well, there are several important tricks to get this working. Um, and here in this figure on the right, we're showing a sequence of adding more and more complexity um, to the text to 3D system. So first, uh, we can think about adding more camera sampling. So uh, in our original Dreamfield's work, we didn't randomly sample the cameras from the entire hemisphere. 
uh, we sampled from just a subset of, um, of elevation, but all different azimuths around the volume. Um, if we sample more positions, we get better models. But if you look at this bulldog wearing a pirate hat, you can see it's got two heads. It's kind of like concave. It definitely doesn't look like a really good coherent bulldog. Um, if we add in view dependent prompts, um, then we can see that now instead of having many, many different heads, it's starting to look more like one coherent bulldog. View dependent prompts are where we modify the text description based off of the camera that you sampled. So if, we, if we're rendering the 3D model from the front, we add front view to the text caption. If we render it from the side, we add side view. And this is, I think, one of the grossest hacks in the system, um, but it's currently very critical to get good results. And some of the other open source models like Stable Diffusion don't seem to be as sensitive to these view dependent descriptions and the quality of the results is often worse. They're less coherent 3D models because of that. Um, what's nice is if you just look at the, the top image, this is looking at a render of the color output from NERF. We can also shade it using a point light or other lighting within the scene. And we can look at, um, in the bottom, this is a textureless rendering. So just looking at the geometry, you can see that even though the um, RGB image up here looks pretty decent, the underlying 3D geometry is still pretty noisy. Um, so we also added in this lighting model and illumination during training time. And that you can see produces much better geometry. It's smoother, uh, it's more reflective of looking like a dog. Um, but there's still ways in which, for example, this black hat, um, when we render it with lights, it's still black. And so it doesn't reveal some of the noise and problems with the geometry. So we also added textureless renderings where we actually feed to the diffusion model, not the colorful render up here, but the textureless render down here. Uh, and that often can produce better looking geometry, but you start baking into the 3D geometry uh, things that are just texture based. So you can see the skull and crossbones get embossed into the hat now instead of just having it drawn on in some of the earlier models. Um, so this is, I think all these tricks were important for us in order to enable higher quality 3D geometry, which we think is really important if you want to reuse these assets in different settings. Any questions on all these tricks? I see a hand. Yeah, so going back to the view dependent prompts thing, uh, that was like my main like question about, uh, is there a path forward to like spec like specifying like a specific location to do a camera from? Because like when I use these generative models, kind of just gives me whatever and then I have to just deal with it. Yeah, and I, I don't know, like the front facing is kind of a gross hack. So is there a, a path forward to like? Yeah, I think we've been thinking about this a lot. We don't have any great solutions, honestly. I think there's, you could imagine leveraging some 3D data where you have labels for what the front view, side view, back view of different objects looks like. I think that's one path forward is trying to have data sets that you could fine tune or optimize this from. Um, but I think it is, I think it's still an open question of how to move beyond some of these hacks. And I think some of these, you know, some sometimes even if I say like the back view of a Chihuahua wearing sunglasses, um, the model really wants to put sunglasses on the back of that Chihuahua's head because then this caption sunglasses doesn't make sense. You probably wouldn't have written that caption. So I think we probably need to think about using maybe even language models in the loop for altering the description based off of the prompt um, or based off of the view that you're looking at the object from. But yeah, I don't think we've come up with any robust solutions yet. And I think that's been one of the most frustrating uh, failure modes of the system. Cool, great questions. Uh, Okay, so, so maybe just walking through one more time, how does this full end-to-end -end Dream Fusion system work for going from a text prompt to a whole 3D model? We have a NERF and that NERF is gonna output a density and a color or albedo for every point in this three-dimensional space. Uh, we're gonna compute from the density field, the normals. So the normals are just what's the gradient of the density field. And then we're gonna use those normals combined with a random light source to shade the 3D model. We can then combine the shading with the albedo to produce our rendered uh, colorful image here of a, again, of a peacock on a surfboard. Um, and then we can choose a camera to view that full 3D model and render it down to an image. We also have, it's not depicted here, but we also have kind of an environment map that's optimized over as well to form a background uh, for the 3D object. And then similar to the case I showed before in terms of optimizing over an image, we're gonna take this rendered image, add random noise to it, and then feed it through the UNET model given the text caption. Here it's not written here, but the text caption is going to depend on the view. And then we just are going to augment front view, side view, overhead view, rear view based off of that. And then uh, the UNET is going to tell us how should we should move in pixel space. And then we can transform that back to how we should move and update the weights of the NERF that are parameterizing the density and color. 
um, just using backpropagation. And there's a few other regularization losses that we add in here, um, but this is kind of the full, the full system that we built. And the shading, of course, I think is very important if you care about geometry, but there's also been um, some cool recent work that doesn't have shading and is still able to produce decent 3D models. Uh, okay, so what does this actually look like um, over the course of optimization? I think I've just been showing you guys full, fully optimized 3D models. So this is, again, the peacock. And each row of this video is going to be a different fixed camera view of the 3D model as it's optimizing to match this text description. Um, and so you can see it starts to form this shape. Um, we also have a system that's somewhat coarse defined. So it starts off smoother, and then it adds more details over time. And it doesn't fully converge. It tends to wiggle around a little bit. Um, but I think one of the big things we've also been exploring is trying to improve this optimization process. This is so different from how a 3D modeler is going to create a 3D object. Um, they wouldn't just kind of have this blobby thing and add more and more details. You think about the, the overall structure and then adding in, I mean, maybe you have the overall structure and then add in details, but uh, it's definitely different from at least how I would approach 3D modeling um, this kind of system. And the different columns, I guess I didn't explain this, the different columns are different ways of looking into the model. The first is the uh, the render, the second is just the color without the shading, and then this is a depth map, a normal map, and then an opacity map that's showing you where the density is. Uh, so I'll just play it one more time. But yeah, it's a pretty weird creative process in 3D. Um, and as the end result, we do have uh, a relatable asset because we were doing this random shading, and we also built a way of exporting these models to meshes. So on the website, we have a few uh, meshes up there. Um, and yeah, it works for a huge diversity of text prompts. Um, we use a pre-trained language model from Imagine. Uh, so it se that seems to be really critical to enable both the view dependence and also generality across all these different objects. And it works a lot of the time, but I would say maybe there's a like 40 to 50% success rate with these things. A lot of times you'll, ha you'll still have too many heads. Um, you'll still have too many limbs. There's something that uh, won't be quite right with these models. And if you look really carefully, I think this whole panel might look good, but if you look really carefully at any individual object, you can often find failures or ways in which this 3D model isn't quite right. Um, so I think I think this is like a great first pass, but I think these systems still need a lot of work before they're able to produce usable 3D assets for the kinds of AR and VR projects that I hear you guys are working on. Um, something that is still fun though is uh, we, we only have this knob of text, but you can add more and more detail to get more and more detailed characters. So you can start with a photo of a squirrel. Uh, you can dress it in a kimono or in a suit of medieval armor. You can send it to a ceramics class um, or onto a motorcycle. And we don't currently have a way of preserving the identity of this, uh, this particular squirrel throughout this process, but it often uh, generates something similar as you add more and more to the prompt. So you can kind of use this to create a sequence of um, rich characters or interactions. And I think some of the coolest things that happened after uh, we released some of the meshes was people 3D printed them. I never 3D printed anything before in my life. And it was super cool to see people 3D print stuff. And then I, of course, had to go about learning how to do it. Um, and you can also take these meshes and use them in different AR applications. Uh, this, I think, is uh, a frog actually getting printed. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's very cool to be able to now go from some description of an, of an object to an actual 3D object that can be in your hand. Right now, the process is painfully slow, but I think there's an exciting feature where these things could, you know, you could envision a toy and just have it appear. Uh, there's a question. Yeah, Ben, this is Steve. Uh, thanks for the talk so far. This is really awesome. Uh, obviously, amazing work. The, um, the, the geometry looks amazing um, on these. The, the imagery looks a little cartoony. I was curious why, um, why the colors are so saturated. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, yeah, I, I'll go into that maybe a little bit in a second, but um, yeah, it's a huge problem, and I think it's a fundamental flaw in our approach, and we don't have a fix yet. <laughs> I'll get back to that, yeah. Was there another hand up? Yeah, I was wondering, um, is there any sort of programmatic way to add rigging to these models after you've generated, say, the scroll of medieval armor? Yeah, so I... Um, I have no clue about this. Some Someone on Twitter uh, took our meshes and plugged it into a software package called Mixamo that takes a mesh and then like automatically does some animation of it. That seems really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, there's nothing in our system that automatically does rigging, but I think there is some other software out there that tries to take meshes and then automatically rig them if they um, match some certain criteria. 
And I think since the um, papers come out, it's been really amazing to see a lot of rapid progress on 3D and 3D plus time generation. Um, NVIDIA had some cool work moving to higher resolution diffusion models that adds a lot more detail to the 3D models, but you can see they're still um, quite oversaturated. There was some cool work on latent nerf, which is a way faster way of optimizing for these models, but still, I think, takes around 30 minutes or longer. It's still painfully slow. Um, AJ had a cool paper on vector fusion. You can use this to optimize uh, vector graphics instead of 3D models. And there is some work on style GAN fusion, which was taking an existing style GAN to generate cats and adapt it based off of some text description. Um, and Luma also has a product that they've launched around um, text to 3D that I think you can sign up for and, and play with. Um, and there's also folks that are, you know, text is one way of controlling and generating 3D models. We probably want way richer forms of supervision and control, for example, going from an image to an entire 3D volume. Um, but I think it's still, you know, all these approaches I think are make cool demos, but aren't quite there yet in terms of um, usability. And some of that comes from, you know, the meshes aren't rigged. They're, they don't follow the kind of, sort of topology that you want for different applications and animations. So I think we still have a lot, uh, I, th I think we have a lot of work left to do on the research side before these things are, are truly useful for, uh, for folks in AR, VR, and 3D printing. Um, yeah, so I guess I mentioned some of this. Um, is the problem solved? I think we were pretty excited with a lot of these results, and I encourage everyone to check out the gallery on our website for um, just seeing the diversity of things that you can generate from text. Um, but it's slow. It takes from like 30 minutes to an hour and a half to generate one of these models. And then so you sit there, you see your generation isn't quite what you want, um, and now you have to wait another hour to get another result. Um, and this isn't the kind of creative tool that I think folks that are working with these systems want to build and use. You really want to be able to interactively edit, modify, have a generative model that can fill in the pieces that you don't like, but keep the pieces you do like. Um, so we're just not quite there in terms of control and in terms of the interactive speed. Um, there's also a lot of bad 3D geometry. Uh, the view-dependent prompts aren't super robust. Sometimes you say side view of a thing and the diffusion model doesn't know what the side view should look like. Um, and in terms of usability, oftentimes we bake in a lot of lighting effects. So there'll be shadows and specularities that appear in the albedo, which shouldn't be there. So if you wanted to export this asset and use it in some, um, some virtual world, it would look pretty weird because the lighting would be different on the 3D model than the lighting within the scene. Um, so that's something we're excited about trying to address as well. I think the thing that bugs me the most and keeps me up is uh, improving the loss. Like we have this one, one hacky loss for trying to combine a image and text and scoring it using a diffusion model. And it has a bunch of negative properties um, uh, also, like Steve was pointing out, um, they're oversaturated, they're over smooth, the colors are pretty weird, and we don't have a fix yet. I think um, I'm hopeful and optimistic that someone will come up with a fix, but we tried a lot of things and haven't been able to figure it out yet. Um, I think we mentioned this too before. These are just some of the kinds of failures you see with this. Uh, uh, John Barron coined the Janus problem after a Roman god that had two heads. Um, so here you can see this is a, I think like a yellow cartoon character with a mustache, and you get four different front views instead of just a front view and side views. This is the Chihuahua and inner tube wearing sunglasses. And both sides of it look good. You know, from an image perspective, almost every view of this looks good. There's a few views where you can see from the image that something's weird and there's two different heads. Um, but it's very rare that it occurs. You can kind of see why it's hard. Making sure that things look good in 2D is often not going to give you exactly the 3D model you want. Um, you can have very small, uh, you know, a very small set of views that could be problematic. And then the resulting 3D model is inaccurate. And this overly cartoony, overly saturated problem is one that uh, you know, we, we saw early on and haven't been able to fix. Um, I think to understand why this problem exists, you need to understand a little bit more about diffusion models. And I think there, there's this one magical trick which everyone uses to get good quality results out of their models, which is called classifier uh, free guidance. And the idea is if I have some text description, normally we would think about sampling an image given that text description. Um, but when we do that, the images often don't correspond so well to the text. Maybe it's because the data set you collected had noisy labels for images and text. So sometimes I got a random image paired with a particular text caption. And one way of thinking about what, what uh, diffusion sampling with classifier-free guidance is doing is it's adjusting this distribution of things, of, of images, to select the images that are really likely given the text and less like a typical image. So you're saying, I really, when I say that I want a chihuahua wearing sunglasses, I really, really want a chihuahua wearing sunglasses. I don't want kind of a, a random chihuahua. Um, and so there's a cool paper from Jonathan Ho and Tim Salmons demonstrating the effectiveness of this technique at improving the quality of samples. This is from uh, ImageNet model, and I think these are Huskies or Malnutes um, in honor of you guys. 
Uh, so you can go from low guidance weight where this weight up here is zero to high guidance weight where it's large. And you can see on the left, a bunch of these samples don't look great. They're not super coherent. But on the right, they all look pretty good as we increase this guidance value. And in the 2D setting, we can kind of tune this knob to get better quality and better correspondence with the text at the cost of reduced diversity of images. But in the 3D case with this score, or even in the 2D case with this score distillation loss, um, we have a different problem. And that is when we have a small guidance strength. Here in the image case, this is, this is normal ancestral sampling in diffusion models. This is optimization-based sampling using the score distillation loss. When we have a small guidance strength here, you don't get a random looking image, you get a very over smooth image. That's something like the mode of the distribution. And as we increase this guidance strength, we do start getting things that correspond well with the text, um, but they often are higher contrast than oversaturated. And if we, we can't just turn this knob down, because if we turn this knob down, you start losing any coherence. There was a question. Yeah, I was just asking about like the um, problem with speed for generating mm -hmm. these NERF models. And um, I, I read a paper on quantum radiance fields, I think, um, which um, claim to speed up the um, process of generating these models by a factor of like 100 or so. And I was like wondering if you have any like um, knowledge on those papers or you're looking further. Yeah, there's a lot of cool work on speeding up neural rendering um, and making it orders of magnitude faster than the methods we're using here. I would say around half of our compute is spent on neural rendering and half of it is spent on the diffusion model. So even if we, even if the neural rendering costs nothing, um, that would only give, in, give us like a 2x speed up in terms of training time. 2x is great, but I think we need way more than that for these methods to yeah. be usable. Um, it is certainly great for deploying the models. You don't have to convert it to a mesh. You could potentially just use these fast neural rendering methods as is. Um, but yeah, sadly, we still are going to be bottlenecked by this iterative. We have to evaluate this diffusion model 10,000 or 15,000 times. And that's still, it's this neural network unit. And we don't really have a way of speeding that up yet. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in general, I'd say that there's, there's still a gap between when we're just optimizing in pixel space, there's still a gap between normal sampling from diffusion models and this optimization based approach that we've proposed. Um, and we need to narrow this gap if we want 3D generation to look better is kind of my hunch. And I don't have any ideas left for how to do that, but I hope that someone out there will be able to uh, understand some of the technologies and tools and build a new way of using a diffusion model as a loss that could improve some of these quality issues. And here's an example, I guess these were examples in 2D. Here's an example in 3D, how important this guidance strength knob is. You know, this is one of many hyperparameters, but it's one of the most important parameters when you're thinking about using diffusion models in different settings. And as we turn up this knob, we tend to get more, these are, I think, uh, robots eating dinner. Um, and as you turn up the knob uh, to the right, you can see that you get more quality, more detail, um, but the colors start getting weirder, weirder and weirder and higher and higher saturation. Um, but if you turn it down, you start losing the 3D model entirely and it even starts to shrink um, in some weird way. So we still don't have a great handle on exactly why this happens, but I think one intuition for why this might happen is that high dimensional spaces are weird. Um, if you think about a high dimensional Gaussian distribution, the most likely point in the high dimensional Gaussian is right at the center at the mode. But if we look at typical samples, kind of if I draw a random Gaussian sample, almost all of them are gonna concentrate on some shell at square root of the dimensionality. So the mode is really different from a typical sample. And some of what we're doing converting these diffusion models from pixel space sampling to an optimization based approach with this loss function is searching more for modes. Um, but in high dimensions, we know that's not a great strategy for generating samples. And I think that's why we need this really high guidance knob is to uh, try to reduce the amount of stuff that's out there for us to find. So yeah, I think I've been, you know, uh, since the paper came out and since we've been doing this research, extremely frustrated with, it's awesome that this stuff works, but it also has these failures and we don't have any solutions right now for handling them. Um, it's nice in that our method for piecing together, coming up with the score, uh, a loss function from diffusion models works. It lets us create really cool 3D content, um, but it requires the stronger conditioning and high guidance weight, which makes things oversaturated and over smooth. We also don't really know how to, um, use this kind of approach with other models, like autoaggressive models such as Dolly, Party, and Muse um, for, for 3D generation. I think it'd be really great if we could 
find corresponding loss functions like this that worked with other uh, generative models because diffusion models are just one class of models that are hot right now, but who knows what people will be using next year. And yeah, I really am continue to be in search of a better way to produce good samples via optimization uh, from our existing best in class 2D priors. But still, I think it is cool. 2D priors enable 3D synthesis. We don't have to collect any 3D data to build these things. And these 2D models are constantly improving. So like we could hopefully take our techniques and tools, wait a year, and just use whatever the next greatest text image diffusion model is and have better results. We don't have to change anything on the methodology. We don't have to retrain on additional data sets. We can just run this extraction procedure of optimizing a NERF um, on these new diffusion models. So I think that's super cool. Um, there's also been, um, as was mentioned, better work on uh, improvements in differential three, differentiable 3D models like Incident GP. You can do faster rendering. Um, we can add in more realistic lighting into these models as well. Um, and there's been some amazing recent work, uh, like for example, make a video 3D that enables video priors that can do not just a static 3D thing, but an animated 3D thing, which is something that is, I have heard is very painful and hard to do um, by hand. But I think making those 3D assets that are moving over time usable is still a really tough open question. And I think there's like a philosophical question that a lot of people ask me, which is, do we need 3D data for 3D generation? Um, and I'm hopeful that we won't, but I think that there's there's still a lot of issues with these approaches and maybe 3D data would, would just solve it. Um, so with that, yeah, thank you guys for uh, all the great and interesting questions and happy to um, answer any more questions now. Hi, Ben, I had another question. Um, so I was thinking about your slide where you had all the columns of the peacocks and you, there was like density and there was shading. Um, I just wanna check my understanding. Am I correct in assuming that you're, you're essentially taking all those columns and there's some sort of mapping function that just turns that into a 3D model? And we're contrasting that with a more intuitive way of constructing a model, which would be like, come up with the uh, the rough outline and the add detail over time. Um, yeah, so here are these different columns. You can think about them. Yeah, like the the shading or this normal map, for example, in this column. Um, was this the figure you're thinking of? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I think here, um, part of these, like the, the reason to show some of these visualizations is to highlight it's kind of like debugging for us to like see what's going on behind the scenes and the geometry and the depth maps and the normals because it's really easy to create 3d renders that are optical illusions like we kind of like rediscovered a bunch of opti like classic optical illusions uh through some of the optimization process in this work um but i think yeah i i guess what i would say is that there's something a little bit weird about how we're creating these 3d models and if we could maybe match some of the creative process of 3d generation on the computer side to how we think about as humans generating 3D content. I, I wonder, I don't know, I wonder if maybe that would improve the quality of these results or the robustness or allow them to be more controllable. And maybe one example um, from this latent NERF paper was maybe you have a rough shape or an outline of what you want your 3D model to look like. You can add in a loss function which says, hey, I want my 3D model to be kind of close in shape to this existing shape and then optimize for something that looks like the text prompt but is a little bit more constrained. Uh, so, and I think, yeah, coming up with more ways of controlling these models and matching some kind of having some more interaction, I think is really important uh, for, for actually making them usable, but also for controlling some of the quality. If you can create any 3D shape, sometimes it's going to create something really wacky. So it sounds like having something iterative could yield better results. Um, so then as a quick follow-up, is the current approach to essentially generate a model in like full detail, and then this is just the debugging method? Yeah, yeah, we do generate the model in full detail. And this is this is kind of visualizing um, over the course of optimization what's happening. Uh, it's just like a debugging visualization as opposed to something that we use for, for creating the final model. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much for the talk. It was very interesting. Thanks. I don't know who is next. Uh, feel free to, to shout out questions. Would you feel that that uh, Magic 3D addresses any of the main limitations that you raised with this project? Yeah, I think they, uh, resolution, I think was one. Um, they did an additional fine tuning pass with the stable diffusion model. And I think they get more details. They also were using, they like converted it to a mesh and then optimized using a differentiable mesh render instead of volumetric rendering, which I think is a really cool way of controlling meshes and adding a little bit more texture details that we haven't been able to get. But I think fundamentally they use the same loss functions and um, kind of the same general algorithms that we're using. So I think unfortunately, like I haven't seen any work yet that 
uh, really solves, for example, this view dependence issue um, or the oversaturation from the loss function. I think it's still a major issue. And if you look at the Magic 3D results, I think they have a lot of better texture details, but their colors are pretty weird. Um, and I think that's that comes from these high guidance weights combined with the distillation loss uh, that we're using. And I don't, I think that's still a unknown, unknown question how to solve. Hey, thanks for the great talk. I'm not familiar with this field, but I wonder how good our previous methods on 2D to 3D generation, like to generate a 3D model from one shot or a few shot images. Yeah, um, great question. I am not an expert in the space, but I've been trying to read more papers. And I think that the current state of like 2D to 3D generation is not great. What people typically do is they take the 2D thing and they run a monocular depth estimation. So they kind of say, for every point in this observed 2D image, roughly how far away do I think it was? Um, and they use, then they kind of try to fill in the remaining details. Um, but I, yeah, I do think current 2D to 3D approaches uh, don't work robustly when you have like real world images. They might work well if I train on cars and I give you a car. Um, or in, for example, faces or domains, we have, there's some cool methods for restricted domains where the movement is just like a little bit, not like, full 360. And there are some 2D to 3D approaches I think have been working well. Um, but but yeah, I do, I do think that there's there's a lot of like uh, ongoing research for trying to improve 2D to 3D synthesis. And if you have many images, then you can do things like normal NERF, or there's like few view NERF uh, or 3D reconstruction. But for a single 2D image, I think it's still really hard. Thinking what's the potential of the approach, say you first use diffusion models to generate many images from the text prompt mm -hmm. that are coherent. Perhaps you can play with the text prompt to have different viewpoints to get a bunch of coherent new uh, 2D images and then generate a 3D model from there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great idea. We had tried something somewhat related. So there's this work, uh, Dream Booth, that allows you to adapt the diffusion model to a few images of a particular subject. And um, then you can generate a bunch of more images of that subject. Maybe you could add view dependent prompts to try to get some variety. But a lot of these NERF models aren't very robust to non-aligned images or unaligned images. So if I, if I try to do 3D reconstruction from a bunch of images that are from different views, but not exactly right or corresponding to the same underlying 3D model, then they tend to produce a lot of blurring. Um, but it is, yeah, I think there might be or... a way of adapting models more. Or you may even start from, say you first use your diffusion model to generate one image from your prompt. And from there, you, you, use, you do a, a few more diffusion steps to slightly adjust to make all the images you generate align better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that could be cool. Uh -huh. and. Yeah, it's a cool idea. I think that there's, yeah, there's bound to be other and better ways of, of using a diffusion model for 3D generation. And I think, yeah, having some iterative process where you generate an image and then adapt the images and kind of alternate back and forth between the 3D model and the images you generate sounds like a cool idea. Um, but, but yeah, I think uh, exciting to see you get that working. <laughs> Thank you. Megan, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, so I have a question. You, you were talking about how uh, going from the text to 3D model was an issue, especially with the, you were talking about the guidance factor and, and the fact mm -hmm. that labels were sometimes fuzzy. So in our project, we are trying to uh, attempt to like do a text to asset retrieval um, mechanism. So I was wondering what kind of issues you ran into we should watch out for when doing that like aspect. Yeah, so it is like you have a text description and like a database of assets and you wanna yeah. compare them. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think it's a, uh, I don't know in particular, I think the easiest thing would probably be to do this with like clip or an embedding model versus the doing like using comparisons according to the diffusion model losses. Um, and I think there, yeah, I think if you just use clip similarity instead of a diffusion similarity, my guess is it might work better. I think even though the diffusion models are good at, I think better at 3D generation, if you're trying to ask whether or not two images are similar or text and an asset are similar. I think that some of the clip models are exactly designed for this purpose and trained for this purpose and work pretty well. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't think I've ever tried this personally and I'm not sure whether the diffusion model would beat 
the clip batting thing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ben, for the fantastic talk. It's just so awesome. I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm curious, like, if you have to give advice for, like, you know, all the new students that are probably, like, listening to your talk, and it's like, oh, my gosh, my mind is blown. Can I do something about it? Uh, can I participate? Like, what's, how would you, how would you recommend to get started? And, like, is there some, or get, like, you know, get involved? Yeah, it's a great question. I think what's cool is that there's a lot of open source tools that you can use right now to start playing around with a bunch of these approaches. Uh, like a week after we released our paper, there was a stable DreamFusion implementation that someone made on GitHub. So I think you have to play around with these tools. And I think a lot of what works and doesn't work, um, you, can't, you can't just like think about it. You have to actually get your hands dirty with these different models and explore them. And they fail in all sorts of ways. And you read a paper and you see the results and you think everything is amazing and we should use this. And then you try it out and it fails in all sorts of like awful, awful ways. I think, um, yeah, my main advice is just to, to try exploring and using some of the tools that you have access to in space. And I think also thinking about uh, the ways that they fail and the ways that they could be improved, I think is often, it's there, there's many steps of this pipeline. I myself work a lot on the algorithms and methods, but more than the algorithms and methods, the reason that we are where we are right now in text image generation is someone worked really hard on data set collection. Um, and someone needs to do more work on evaluation and understanding how these models work well in different settings. So I think there's there's all sorts of cool work to be done at various stages of the pipeline. And there's also increasing access to these tools. So I think it's a really incredible time to be working in this generative space um, and trying to bridge the gap between the people that are creating things and the applications that people want to solve. Awesome. Is there any other questions? If not, we'll conclude at this point. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. It's been great. Uh, great to, to hear all the questions and uh, thank you for the attention. It's been fun. And guys, please let's do some applause.